Hi, oh. Jonathan. Hi. How, how are you? Good, good. I'm going to go grab my headphones because we did a test yesterday with Jen and I just need uh, those ones. It was the best quality. Yeah, sounds good. Hi, Farbud. Hi, everyone. Hi. How are you? Good, thanks. Hi, guys. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. So we are recording it, Tina, Tina We're from recording. the beginning. Yes, we'll, we'll edit this out. <laughs> yeah, Nobody I was trying to set up my background case. at the first time, uh -huh. I didn't know it was recording. Farbad, are you going to be the one who is uh, sharing your screen? Yeah, okay, you do you want to put your presentation up? Yeah, I'm just pulling it up now in Teams. Is it better or? Yeah, it looks good, Razi. Okay. All right, we want to go to the business context one. I just want to see if this is the, the version. You're nice and clear, Jonathan. Awesome. Perfect. This is this is good. I took out the, uh, the, the report on the one slide just to put it at the end. It doesn't change anything. It's fine. Cool. So I can see your presentation, you guys. Uh, I can see you. I can hear you very well. So Razi will be your MC for today. So uh, as Jen went over yesterday, Jonathan, as we talked about for about yesterday, what will happen is five minutes prior um, to your presentation, the virtual doors will open, people will start to filter in. And then at three minutes past the hour, Razi will come on, you guys can feel free to join her on camera as well. Brief intro. She'll leave. You guys will do your presentation, and then questions will come in the chat on the right hand side, and Razi will field those questions for you. She'll join you when you are done your presentation. She'll come back on camera, and then you guys will do the Q and A that way. In the, be in the beginning, should I just should I wait until we do intros yeah. and then turn on the presentation? Uh, yeah. If you want, it's totally up to you. Okay. Yeah. Just because sure. I can see, I can see people now. It would be nice. To, I'm, I'm not on my normal two, two display setup, so it's yeah, fine. yeah, that's totally fine. Okay. Uh, Works for me. And then um, Razi, I just wanted to double check. Do you guys just want to give um, correct pronunciation of your first and last names, just like that? Razi knows. Jonathan. So I can... Okay, uh, Jonathan. What was your last name? Renessa. Renessa. Correct, Ranasa. I'll call you with like both of you with first name if it's okay, like mm -hmm. during the presentation. Yeah, okay. Razi, your audio is a little choppy. My audio is not. It's a bit choppy. Your audio. Is it choppy for you guys too, or is it just? Yeah. Me? Yeah, it's choppy, right? Even your video is choppy. It's choppy? Yeah. Just want to make sure. So, so let me change my voice. So, we can't hear you. Yeah. Me now. Can you talk a little bit more? So can you hear me now? Um, oh, it's a bit better, yeah. 
together? It's better for me. How about you, Carbo Jonathan? Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's a bit Great. better now. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. Awesome. Perfect. So what I'll do is I'll hop off. Um, you guys can feel free to shut off your uh, mute yourselves and then shut off your video. And then Rosie will come back on uh, when it's time. And then we'll start the talk. Um, if the keynote runs long, our keynote's going on on the main stage right now. Um, Razzie's just gonna wait for us to give the cue. So if it does run long, Razzie and people start to come into the room, you can jump on camera and just say, we're just waiting for the keynote to finish up. We'll be starting in a couple of minutes, that kind of deal. But hopefully she doesn't run long and we can start on time, okay? Okay. Okay, cool guys, have Thank a good you. talk. Thanks.
Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. We'll start momentarily and uh, we'll uh, giving other people a chance to join us. Uh, so uh, you can start a chat and tell us where are you from and uh, just start networking in the chat. Uh, we'll start in uh, two minutes. Great. So I guess we can start right now. Today we are honored to have Farwood and Jonathan here. Uh, hi Farwood, hi Jonathan, welcome. Uh, yeah, uh, how do you pronounce your company's name? It's Trillium Health Partners. Exactly. Trillium Health. Great. So. So today we're going to talk about uh, Farbot and Jonathan are going to talk about solving the infrastructure uh, so solvings for infrastructure thoughts to cloud. Uh, Farbot is a data scientist, software engineer, and technology leader. Um, he is an adjunct, is a prof professor at De La uh, Lana School of Public Health, and uh, he led the team in the design and implementation of a healthcare data science solution in eight different hospitals across four different provinces. We have also Jonathan here. He's a project manager and project lead uh, with Trillium Health Partners. Uh, he has a background and interest in process engineering and operations research, and he brings a unique change management perspective to the, um, to the impacts of machine learning on healthcare processes. Farbod and Jonathan are concerned about implementation gap that prevents AI algorithms from having a real world impact on patients' care. This failure can be caused by a number of factors, including addressing the wrong problems, poor design, lack of access to the right data, lack of appropriate infrastructure, and AI algorithm degrade, degrade, degrading with the time. Uh, so guys, we are so thrilled to have you here. The stage is yours, and um, yeah. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks so much, Razi. Uh, I'll kick us off. Let me share my screen here. And uh, thanks for that kind introduction. Um, we are from Trillium Health Partners. Um, for those of you who are not from Ontario, Trillium is a health system uh, based out of Mississauga um, and Brampton. It's just sitting outside of Toronto. Um, and this, as uh, Razi mentioned, it's, uh, the talk today is around um, our journey, if you will, to, towards the, the deployment of an AI algorithm um, and really solving for data infrastructure through the cloud as the bigger theme, if you will. So um, I'll start off the, the presentation. I'm going to kick it off to my colleague, Jonathan. Um, we are both from the Institute for Better Health within Trillium, but we'll tell you about that uh, shortly in a second. So with that said, um, just to give you a sense of the agenda for today, we're going to start talking about who we are, um, a bit about Trillium. Um, then we'll talk about uh, some of the, the, the problem that we try to solve and that we're presenting to you about today. 
Um, then we'll go through the actual content of the presentation, which we've, which we've broken apart into two sections around data science side of it and then the, the cloud deployment side of it. So this is um, where, where we decided we'd start this um, a bit differently. We're almost starting with our results. So this is kind of the end result of what this whole talk is about. This is what we did. So what we ended up doing is we evaluated four different statistical models on um, this problem of census, which we'll tell you about shortly. And the final output is really an automatic report uh, that gets generated daily and gets sent to uh, decision uh, makers within the hospital. And the AI algorithm is what's really empowering and uh, producing the, the predictions that are is being sent out. Um, so we'll talk a bit about the, the, the data science and the machine learning side of it. Then we'll talk a bit about the, the cloud side of it, the how. Uh, which is what we ended up doing is actually deployed a, uh, this this project as a proof of concept on the clouds um, in collaboration with the UBC Cloud Innovation Center. Um, because of the time uh, constraints with the talk today and just a format, um, we are not going to go too deep into the weeds, but uh, we do have a technical blog. Uh, I believe this presentation will be available after. Uh, so feel free to browse that blog. It'll give you all the resources that you need, but we'll, we'll talk uh, through it uh, quite a bit today. But if you want more, there, you can always browse the blog and, and read it in depth. So uh, to talk a bit about Trillium uh, that I mentioned, for those of you who are not familiar with, um, we are one of Canada's largest hospitals. So we have uh, over 1.7 million patient visits a year. Um, it, we have the number one uh, surgeries and procedures each year with over 72,000 of them. Um, the, uh, as you can imagine, being based out of a very large community such as uh, Mississauga and Brampton, uh, we have a very high number of emergency visits um, and we serve the entire population of Mississauga, Peel and Halton, which is around 2.2 uh, million people in total. Um, and you can see it's, uh, we cover the full suit of medical op um, procedures. So uh, we cover all, all the way from emergency care to cardiac and cancer care. Um, what makes Trillium quite unique other than the situation, uh, the location from which it's scheduled uh, or it's located rather, is the amount of investment that the hospital has done in the data infrastructure. So you can see uh, consistently year over year, there's been very, very large investments made um, in terms of making sure that uh, the data assets are kept up to date. So the, the, the two most recent ones that I'll draw your attention to is that uh, Epic, uh, the EMR was launched in 2020. And before that, there's a brand new PAC system in place. Uh, so it's really, uh, it's, it's amazing to be working with um, end of the line, if you will, equipment. Uh, just to give you some context in terms of why we're talking about the census problem today, um, Trillium, because of, again, where it's located, um, there is a, a very large amount of growth in population expected, 45% um, to be specific by the year 2041. So the, the, the hospital needs to respond um, very quickly and very efficiently to this demand. And that's really the bigger context around some of the work that we will be presenting today. Um, for those that are not, again, from Toronto, Mississauga is a very, very diverse population, which is one of the most amazing things about working in this field of data science here. Um, we, as, as we've covered, there's the projected 20-year growth in, in patient demand is, you'll see us on the, the red dot in that uh, graph on the top right. It's, it's way above and beyond uh, what anyone has expected, it, and it's extremely diverse, um, the population that, uh, that the hospital serves which is that entire uh, region that you'll see on the map there. Um, the, we, uh, Jonathan and I are working uh, from the AID lab or the AI Innovation and Deployment Evaluation Lab within the Institute for Better Health. Um, how, we like to, how we like to tell people about it is, it, you know, uh, companies all have R&D departments, but R&D is very rare in the healthcare industry where, you know, uh, consistent uh, investment in, in research, not in a grant and project specific manner, but in a consistent uh, manner is very rare. And that's what the aid lab and IBH uh, Institute for Better Health as a, as a whole are trying to do. So what we're building is a foundation really for AI evaluation and deployment, um, where we're really trying to rigorously evaluate a lot of, a lot of um, algorithms that are out there by um, evaluating them in the most one of the most diverse populations in Canada and really combining that rigorous 
uh, research lens with the uh, real world evidence gathering lens. So what we're really, uh, we're at the frontier of sitting between population health analytics, operational analytics and clinical system analytics. Uh, that's, the, that's the lab that we're from. Um, we have some of the photos of the amazing people that are uh, at the aid lab. Um, we'll do acknowledgements later, but uh, of course, a million thanks goes to all the folks on the screen who basically made everything that we're talking about happen um, and, are, and are continuing to, to push forward and innovate. Uh, Jonathan and I are just representatives uh, here presenting the, the great work that the bigger team has done. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Jonathan, to take to take us through the hospital context. Awesome. Thank you so much, Farba, for that larger context. And uh, as we prepare ourselves to kind of think through the hospital issues that happen day to day, now we spoke to some of those strategic challenges with growth in our population, but our problem has more to do with operational challenges. We can go to the next slide. One of the hardest things with managing, I guess, a data science portfolio is being able to determine, are you working at a strategic level, tactical, or are you working at an operational level? When it comes to operational problems, these are sometimes um, hard problems to solve because your operations, as it matures, its processes needs complementary um, insights to be developed. And what we see on this screen is just a view into the complexity that is required to operate a hospital of our size. We have on screen, there's the ED inpatient and critical care units, and each of them go through a four tier stage of reaction, more better, or proactive changes in their capacity, the number of beds that we are operationalizing for the census that we have in our hospital. Green is regular operations, yellow would be, we're starting to increase spaces for people to reside in. And then red would be, we are starting to get over our comfortable capacity. And then there's a gray zone where there is um, other communications that have to go externally outside of the hospital. This map provides a sense of what the operational leaders need to do. Are we going from green to yellow? Are we going from yellow to red? And what do we do as a result? So this is based on a capacity decision based on census that exists in the hospital. Of course, this is very relevant to a time of COVID and these policies are hospital specific because we're dealing with operational challenges. Tying our data science to a process is essential for being able to influence a hospital. So I'll go to the next slide. Our business context has as follows. There is an age old find demand of beds and staff to patients. This is an age-old problem that every hospital always is going to struggle with as they develop their processes operationally and their technology. We are no different and we wanted to be able to have a view to surges that were in the near term for our hospital specifically in that mapping onto the different functional areas that leaders need to respond to, the ED, inpatient units, and CCC, the critical care teams. We, when we start our project, when we think about this big, big challenge, we really want to just dig into our main decision maker. And so we start our project and this project specifically with user stories, sessions where we gather information from leaders. That leader for us was a director from patient flow and registration. So when we start our project, we really need that high level buy-in, not the operational managers or below. We need that director level or above to say, this is what is important to you. And what was important for our director was to be able to have a view to flow challenges in a few days. Three to five days was what we were mandated to be able to figure out. And we needed that exact number because we needed to translate that into requirements for our modeling. Why is census prediction so important? For our user, census gives them a sense of focusing their energies on do I start operationalizing beds because that takes days and has lead time or do I focus my energy elsewhere? Now, we took that and we started to iterate and started to design and started to improve upon existing reporting tools that existed in our hospital. So what we did was we built further model. Our goal was to build better models and evaluate a, a plethora of models to be able to make better recommendations for our leaders on their operational processes as we co-design processes with models and insights together. And finally, we wanna be able to push this all to the cloud. So just to give you a bit of a framing for our work, we'll go to the next slide. We are gonna discuss this in two phases. I think 
giving that context from a data science perspective is going to be super important in all the work that we did on premises. And one of the challenges that we did to, which Farba will speak to, is there were challenges in working collaboratively. There were challenges in terms of getting the right infrastructure that deploying our work to the cloud really enabled our data pipelining to be able to connect to the cloud, which is also really important for leveraging much more technology that is now readily available. So we'll go through that context. I will go through that phase one context and Farba will talk about the benefits and the results of going through a cloud infrastructure for deployment of this model that we determined. So data science on-prem. So Getting data from a hospital in Ontario can be really challenging because of the functional groups that exist. Just data acquisition alone, there are decision support teams, business intelligence teams, and then a host of information systems, teams that you have to work through the database administrators. Are you going to leverage the previous ETL packages or are you going to go straight to enterprise service bus? Where are you going to get your data? This is the first phase of our work for in terms of our business requirements. We source all of our work from the electronic health records, and we did so for four years for our analyses. To better understand and give con context and have a design session with our leaders, we worked on a lot of exploratory data analysis. We treat data exploratory data analysis as just as a more of a consultation, a co-design for our later model development, because we really want to make sure the model we're building is the right um, level of accuracy so we don't continue to do too much work because we can only respond so much to a model prediction. So an additional one MAE, for example, may not be the make or break it for this leader. And so we really needed to explore to our data analysis to determine that. For the models that we decided to work with here, we did a persistence model as our baseline. Now, I know this sounds super simple, but time series, we, we typically jump ahead before doing a baseline and we don't realize that sometimes um, the previous day's prediction may be good enough for tomorrow's prediction. Not everything's exponential growth and recognizing that is super important from a machine learning ops perspective because we do not want to maintain difficult models, especially from an operational standpoint, especially with uh, primarily on-prem on infrastructure going to the cloud where your agile practices are immature. We additionally had a, a specific THP tool which predicted uh, admission prediction with probability distributions. And we had a Serema model, which is very common in time series, as well as we used a Facebook Profit as well, which is an open source package just for time series prediction. All of these we mapped with um, mean absolute error as our, as our evaluation metric. And I really wanna make sure this is key. We are coming from the angle of impact to users and impact for our operational users. They needed to know that an additional mean absolute error of one meant one other patient that you need to care for. We could not have complex metrics. It had to be directly relatable to that user. And that is the best metrics for that difference in lingo that happens between our tech team as well as the operational team that has to do something in the hospital as a result of our recommendations. So that was why we anchored onto these metrics. We can go to the next slide. Just to give a high level perspective, we, we looked at overall trends within four years and determined based on those operating documents. Now we don't make the operating documents, we, we solicit them, we get them and we say, here is how you're performing and here is what your definition of um, surge is. Now operations folk, they don't think statistically, they're not gonna tell you this, you need to show them and help define for them what is a surge for them in their operations. So it's a bit of a joint design session here. And what we use these diagrams, especially our box plot charts, were determining when would a decision be made? Would you make a decision about increasing capacity at the beginning of the week or the end of the week? And it turns out it has to be at the beginning because that's when you have the capacity to operationalize. So our predictions have to happen Monday, Tuesday, for an end date of increasing capacity over the weekend on Thursday, Friday. So it has to happen because of operational constraints. Now this is all part of soliciting feedback and making sure that our tool and our report has impact. And so this is one of the many plots that we use to be able to tailor our solution for our user. And we'll go to the next slide. Now this may be kind of scary for those who do not work in operations for a hospital. Maybe you would prefer I have one box that says hospital, input, output. But our hospital has, as you see in the top here, 
birthing walk-in, birthing registry, C-section uh, scheduling, surgery scheduling, emergency department, clinics, the like. There's so many places where patients come from into our hospital, and this is for just one of our sites. And we have uh, a lot of different places that the patients end up staying and they transition and transfer from one location to another and they end up going home or ALC destinations. ALC is alternative level of care. There's a lot of places they go. Now, when we need to determine a census prediction, we need to determine a census boundary, a system boundary to be able to start modeling around. And we have to determine categories of census. Now, these are where the patients are. We can do the overall hospital or we can do subsets. Now for us, we want impact for our users. So what made sense was not just physical locations, but grouping the different census based on decision makers. And our decision makers are organized by mother and baby, uh, planned care, unplanned care, mental health and rehab. We have decision makers under those categories. So although they're, they manage multiple locations, we want to make sure that they are being reported on based on their uh, decision-making hierarchy that is intrinsic to our hospital. So this was a blueprint, a schematic that led into mapping to clinical systems and being able to determine data elements that were necessary for us. It was a translation tool, so to say. We'll go to the next slide. As a operations researcher, um, I need to start with a statistical control chart. I am not going to build a model unless I know where my variation is coming from. And this was a great place to start. Uh, statistical control charts are providing you with no model heavy, just an understanding, and you can do a moving horizon view of this. Where is your deviation coming from our planned care, unplanned mental health, rehab, and mothers? I'm not going to go into the details here, but I'm just going to highlight one thing. The coefficient of variance, which describes the change, relative change within one of the variables, is the highest within our planned care. This is consist consistent with uh, literature. Planned care is we plan to have a surgery and our volumes change a lot. There are many reasons this happens. Primarily, it is scheduling over the weekend. That is one of the hardest challenges within healthcare. We always schedule a lot on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Saturday, Sunday, we don't have much scheduled. This is an Ontario problem. This helped us understand that we should take apart the aggregate site level prediction and break it into some constituent parts because we could aggregate back up to the site and we can model separately these different functional areas, um, both because the report readers want them, but also would provide us some um, flexibility in modeling these different processes slightly differently. I'll go to the next slide. Now, I'll, I'll close by uh, with these results that I've summarized quite a bit here. On the right-hand side, we have a simple ranking. We, we performed multiple models, um, persistence, our custom probability distribution version of our, our tool, Serema and Facebook Profit. It turns out per different functional area, our THP tool did great. Uh, Serema actually performed really well, or compar like actually comparable to almost all of them except planned care. And rehab it worked best with uh, persistence, just like yesterday was like the same as the next day. What, the principle of selection for us became, especially from an ML ops perspective, was we need to maintain this model. We need to make sure it's flexible, it's resilient. We found that our THP tool, although it was the best on one cut, as, as COVID came, we ended up having challenges with it for maintaining it and continue to tune it. We ended up steering a little bit further towards using Serene as well as Persistence as our go-to models from a maintenance perspective. The left-hand plot, I won't go into detail, but a lot of nature papers, they end up having this cumulative error description just to help communicate to stakeholders. This is cumulatively the error that you start seeing. Primarily, we did this for communication to our stakeholders to, so they visually see how error accumulates differently for these functional areas and how wrong we are. So they acknowledge as well, we're not perfect, our accuracy can't be perfect, but here's relatively how good these different algorithms perform over time. And if there's any spikes, we can comment towards that. I can go to the last slide for myself. Now, we, as a result of this, have this report going out daily, and we are able to give a few different features. We are able to predict admissions, discharges, census. We're also, as per our, um, as our, as our users have asked us, being able to superimpose our predictions with our historical trends and also be able to speak to uh, 
how this impacts the operational policies at the top header, we really need our leaders to be able to say, is there a high, low, medium risk of going to another green to yellow or yellow to orange or orange to gray, for example. So we really needed these and this was a very co-designed set of sessions to get this tool that is bespoke for our institution. So Farabai, I'll hand it off to you as you now speak to, what did we do to get this to the cloud? Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm a bit mindful of time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to focus on the key concepts. Like I mentioned, I'll, delect, uh, I'll, I'll uh, direct everyone who's interested to go to the blog uh, that we showed earlier and you'll find on these slides uh, where all the details will be. But let me just start by talking about well, why, why even bother with the cloud? Um, as our team focuses quite a bit on uh, innovation through research, um, a really big uh, factor for us is the ability to be able to prototype very quickly and ideally um, not with a ton of cost. And that is one of the biggest things that the cloud, uh, having access to a cloud and, uh, environment enabled for us. So if we were to do this on-prem, we would have had to invest on uh, some local uh, compute capacity that uh, would have to be delivered and configured that have to be ordered. So you can imagine the amount of time would be involved would be extended. And because of the fact that we're ordering a, a machine really long-term, there's a, there's a quite a bit of upfront cost, whereas this can be, you know, a, an environment can be quickly spun up. Um, on the cloud in a safe manner. So that's a lot of the work that we did with the with the UBC Cloud Innovation Center was really spinning up that environment in a, in a safe and secure manner. Um, so this is the eventual uh, architecture that we built. I'll, uh, I'll briefly again speak to it and then we'll, we'll get to our lessons learned. Um, so what is happening here and I'll, and I'll draw you uh, draw your attention. So let's, let's start here with our on-premises um, enterprise data warehouse. Uh, on a daily basis, uh, Delta data gets pushed to, uh, in our case, because in this proof of concept, we're using Amazon. This is an S3 bucket um, that it gets pushed to in a, in a staging environment. Um, and then a number of uh, glue jobs run that uh, move the, the, the data through the various uh, levels of refinement, if you will. So this is our, uh, we're building our, burning, building out our data lake here uh, using S3. Um, but that's the, the glue jobs that are responsible for moving data throughout. And of course, everything is being cataloged uh, as we're building this uh, data, um, data lake through the glue data catalog. Um, what I'll mention is how the actual work happened is we actually did quite a bit of the, the training in a SageMaker environment, which is, um, as some of you might be familiar with, is basically a Jupyter notebook in the cloud, which is one of those key things around, again, going back to why the cloud is that enabled us to be very collaborative where it was very hard to share code and share data and have that replicability on-prem before, this is one of the things that going to the cloud and prototyping quickly solved for us. Um, you'll see it's a, it's a bit of a serverless uh, type of uh, setup. So every uh, so since the data gets updated every day, a Lambda function gets triggered, which then runs the model that, we've that Jonathan alluded to earlier and, and spoke to in detail about. Um, we've Dockerized that environment, if you will, Dockerize that model, and that's how the, the work gets done. And now when everything is done here, uh, we are using a script to produce a report. Uh, again, Jonathan showed you guys the report. Uh, that then gets uh, sent out to the users uh, through the simple email service that, again, uh, AWS offers. This is a very high level uh, architecture that we're going through. Uh, again, I would I would refer folks, we, we went through in detail each of these uh, five um, items that I have on the screen here around what challenges we had around security and identity, what uh, around data ingestion, um, what challenges we had and what the, the key lessons learned were uh, in each of those um, buckets of work. But let's go to the actual lessons learned slide. So I'll start with the data science portfolio management. Um, really, as I mentioned, our, our goal has always been to start small in the cloud with proof of concepts. Um, as you can imagine, in the hospital environment, a lot of folks like Jonathan have to uh, mention have to be brought along and there has to be lots of uh, internal capacity building as well as we're introducing totally new tools um, to the enterprise. Um, from from a, a model building, I, I think Jonathan covered this already, so I, I won't touch, a, touch on that one as much. Um, but I think on the cloud deployment, what I'll say is, uh, again, like Jonathan is mentioning, a lot of the cloud native tools um, that abstract away a lot of the uh, complexities of managing uh, systems, um, it, it just makes it a lot easier to, to deal with operations in a much less uh, resource intensive manner. 
and lets people uh, and it allows for prototyping to be done quickly um, and tools to be enabled. So that's that. That was really one of the biggest takeaways that we had from this whole um, cloud environment. Um, I know we're at one, or sorry, at at, at time here. Um, I wanted to take a second to put all these names on the screen. Um, Jonathan and I, as I mentioned earlier, were only here representing the bigger group, but the the work wouldn't have been possible uh, without these folks. And uh, I'll wrap it up here. Um, if you want to join us, please do reach out. Um, I know you have access to the um, to this to these slides. Um, and again, uh, we put the blog down there. If you want to uh, read more about some of our specific technical challenges that we had and some of the lessons learned there. And I'll wrap it up. Thank you so much. Thank you, Farabada and Jonathan. It was great. We have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, first of all, uh, regarding the slides, uh, video will be available after the uh, session, but we're not going to share the slides. Uh, mm, there, there's a question about the cloud you're using. Uh, so mm, they're asking about uh, why UBC and not GCP uh, or AWS or Azure. I can briefly speak to this and I'll ask Jonathan to jump in. Um, we, Because we did this, we were actually, uh, we found out about this amazing initiative, uh, as I mentioned, with the UBC Cloud Innovation Center uh, to do this. So they, they work closely with AWS and they enable this whole work through this proof of concept. We have not, um, that's not a, a, we have not procured a, a platform yet. So we're not commenting on GCP or Azure or AWS. It's, it's just this proof of concept happened to be through the work that we did with uh, UBC Kick. Jonathan, anything you want to add there? No, I think that's exactly it. It was uh, more opportune in terms of the partnerships that we could be able to develop. I think in healthcare, it's so important to continue to be able to develop those partnerships because uh, there's a lot of expertise around different tables. It's just about bringing those people together. And so UBC Kick gave us a lot of expertise to just upskill our entire enterprise and increase our capabilities for future work. Great. Uh, there's another question about, um, it says, is this trauma hospital? If it is not, how does your work compare to what you'd have to do in a trauma hospital? Great question. I think it's uh, maybe like a system boundaries or framing. So the no, I don't not I didn't deal with any trauma um, component of the Trillium that I don't have any knowledge of. What would change primarily would just be some of the transfer and admission components. We wouldn't be dealing with anything clinical here. We're focusing on operations. Um, so I, I would say if there was a trauma component, we would it depends on how the leadership is organized. Our, our focus on this tool is how we can enable those leaders to do their work better. Um, so the best that I can maybe approach the question is a bit of a tricky question. Um, thank you. Um, Anne is asking if you can post the blog address in the chat. Um, and yep, there's I another question. Thank you. Another question uh, from Katrine. It says, how are, you, how are you addressing PHI in the cloud? Jonathan, do you want to take that or do you want me to take it? Yeah, good question. So for PHI in the cloud, this was a very, and I see one other question with the IT team. We were very heavily involved with our security and privacy teams. This was a very good opportunity to co-design a lot of processes internally in our enterprise because there is a lot of tools for anonymization that we were able to leverage as well as being able to determine and better understand data security um, to the cloud, in the cloud, and of the cloud sort of model. So we were better able to categorize these and um, establish more rigorous cloud policies for our enterprise and better thinking around this. Um, so I think PHI in the cloud is not the primary concern. It, it is about like how do you manage uh, risks uh, properly as an enterprise, and so we are able to flesh those out, uh, those details out. And I think for, as an enterprise, it's it's a collective um, experience. There, you need to be able to work on that uh, sort of definitions together. And sometimes we get stuck on those works. I think working on small proof cases like this one is a fantastic way of figuring out how your institution is going to do PHI in the cloud. Thank you. Joseph is asking, so cloud is the way to go and also security is better than on-prem since the CSV applies best of breed, right? I, I mean, so I, I'll, I'll speak on my personal opinion. I, I, I am a big uh, proponent of the cloud as, as the way to go. But like Jonathan mentioned, there's a lot of work that needs to happen 
to bring it to the enterprise and both internally make sure everyone is aligned and those uh, new processes are established on the cloud. Because uh, of course the, the enterprise knows how they're governing um, data locally, but then similar patterns have to be developed. So that's why we're doing it one proof of concept at a time and trying to establish new patterns, for example, for de-identifying data, for moving data securely. All those things, that's why we're doing them one, one POC at a time uh, to try to bring the, the enterprise with us. Um, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, then another question about uh, automate bid assign, uh, um, assignment. Is the goal to automate bid assi assignation? That's a great question. So although I was framing earlier discussions around the operational, tactical, and strategic, strategic would have been, are we going to get more beds in our hospital? Are we going to build a new building? And so that those are strategic questions. We, we dealt with the tactical question, which was, do we want in like a week time to like increase our capacity slightly? Getting to that truly operational question of like, who are, where are you going to go? Are you going to go to this bed? Are you going to go to that bed? That was outside the scope of our work right now. Um, the impact for us was less for our particular user. So I think it's uh, based on a user need at the moment that we do have uh, entire teams dedicated to do that in a more manual process at the moment. Uh, unless the need presents itself, I don't think that we have that in our vision at the moment. Thank you. Uh, there's another question that asks about seasonality effects. Uh, how is seasonality affects traffic? I can try to take that question. I'm a little bit confused by it, but um, the only thing is just a bit of the grammar. Um, I think how do we account for seasonality may be um, That's the question. And uh, well, we worked on a lot of Serena sort of analyses, a lot of correlation plots to be able to determine the best seasonality factors. There's like P and um, Q values that you typically derive for when you're doing seasonality trends. So we did a lot of that in the upfront exploratory data analysis. Um, we did that as well with a lot of our user engagement. We found um, good models for Serema that accounted for the seasonality and that's how we managed it. We did find that other simpler models that don't account this, encounter the seasonality that have more short time windows were performing comparably to the models that we consider the seasonality effects. So we had considered it in some models and then uh, used it for discussion points for our users, but it ended up not being um, during our, for Im our implementation, not uh, all that important for some parts like rehab. I'll give as an example. Thank you. And I think it's the last question. Uh, if I've missed any question, guys, repeat your question in the chat. But if there's a last question that says, um, how large was the IT team actively working on this? Awesome. So the number of components, oh. Let's say in terms of uh, IT team, well, I think active team probably closer to like five to six uh, core team uh, consultations would get up to a dozen or more because just we had to consult with a lot of people from like the tech team side from integration services and security privacy, um, even some database administrators to be able to work with them. So there, there we consulted with many, many, but core team is closer to five, six that actively worked on this as one of their uh, responsibilities throughout a time horizon. And I, I, I think we, we, we made this point already. Like this is a this is definitely a work in progress for us. We're still evolving, we're still developing more patterns, working through more use cases. Um, so it, it, it's exciting work. So we hope we hope folks uh, enjoyed the talk and uh, if they're interested in joining, please do reach out um, through the through the means through the slides. Great. And we have another question. Uh, so how long did the project take from idea to POC? Good question. So I think we actively began after COVID. We had in, we, in, we in set, uh, started the project during, just before actually COVID happened, we had to take it off. And then because of changing priorities inside of our hospital, and we started up more actively September and finished everything with respect to the deployment around April. We're still ongoing in terms of some of our rigorous uh, governance for the cloud because that's kind of the tail end of our work. 
you realize after going to the cloud that you do need to manage accounts, security, and identity management a little bit more rigorous, rigorously. Our bucket list is what we're currently acting on, but I would say the work we presented today is about eight, eight months of working in a portfolio of other projects as well. Great. So perfect. I guess we don't have any questions anymore. If you want to add anything, par uh, Farboat and Jonathan, um, uh, you can uh, say now. Um, nothing else for me. Thanks so much for, for listening. And uh, again, if uh, we would love to, to hear from folks, uh, please do reach out. Yes, likewise here, echoing that. Thanks so much for listening, as well as uh, hoping that all of your enterprise engagements uh, go well and uh, as the maturity of Ontario hospitals improves, we hope to hear from you. Great. Don't miss our next session, guys, at uh, 2.50, and um, have a great day. Bye.